All right, I see the Zoom room is open. Our audience is flowing in. It's nine o'clock Wednesday morning. It's time for the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Thank you for joining us. We'll be getting started in just a minute or two, letting our Zoom room fill up here. Uh, as always, we'd love to know where you are and where you're Zooming in from today. Uh, and, and drop in there if you're an Eagles fan. Uh, today's guest is Eric Long from the Philadelphia Eagles. We look forward to talking to him about his story, about his career, and about the great work that he's doing for the Philadelphia Eagles. So let us know where you're from, if you're an Eagles fan, and uh, uh, welcome into the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Vicki Gensel, fly, Eagles fly, absolutely. Tuning in from Harrisburg, I got Stacy Carell, who's a huge Eagles fan, down in Columbia, Maryland, and Heather in Hummelstown, and um, I see Denise outside of Allentown now in Sykesville, Maryland, is a huge Eagles fan. I know we are a mixing pot if, of sorts here in central Pennsylvania, where we, if you come out here to University Park, uh, there's about half Eagles fans and half uh, and half Pittsburgh Steelers fans, which is all right by me. I'm growing up an Eagles fan. I never thought of the Steelers as a rival. It's better than mixing with Giants fans, that's for sure. I see Rachel Steinberg tuning in from New York City, but Philly raised. Fly, Eagles, fly. Excellent. Uh, we have a partisan house here for you today, Eric. Uh, we will be getting started in just a minute. Welcome everybody in to the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I see Delco represented by Roseanne and Chris Britta is in the Zoom room. Norm, good to see you down in Alexandria, Virginia, a Steelers fan. All are welcome here today, Norm. We are gonna be sharing Eric Long's story and talking about his career and the work that he's doing with the Philadelphia Eagles. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good morning, I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, this session is being recorded and closed captions are available for this event. You can find that information in the chat, in Zoom, or in the comments on Facebook. And welcome to our audience out there on Facebook Live. Today, we are talking with Eric Long. Eric serves as the Vice President of Content and Production for Eagles Entertainment, the internal content department for the Philadelphia Eagles. His team is responsible for the creation, the distribution of multimedia assets across the team's digital, social, and broadcast platforms, as well as production of live events at Lincoln Financial Field. In addition to spending over a decade with the Eagles, Eric has been employed by other, by several other major and minor league sports franchises and has worked as a consultant. I'm excited to welcome Eric Long, Vice President of Content and Production for the Philadelphia Eagles. And fly Eagles fly, Eric, how are you this morning? Doing great, Paul, thank you. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Before we dive into all things Philadelphia Eagles and all things kind of your career, let's start right at the very beginning. Tell us how you became a Penn State Nittany Lion. Well, uh, the, the very short answer, uh, which I think is appropriate given where I've ended up, is football. Um, yeah. When I was uh, in fifth grade, uh, the Penn State had their, their 1994 undefeated season and, uh, you know, basically made a a Penn State fan out of me watching on television. I didn't have any connections with the university through parents or family at that point. Um, but after watching that that undefeated season as a birthday present, my birthday's in mid-September. So as a birthday present, my dad took me to the uh, home opener in the 1995 season uh, against Texas Tech. And there was the Rose Bowl uh, and Big Ten trophy presentations at halftime. And 
we walked the campus, you know, got up, got up the state college early, um, walked around campus, went to the creamery. And basically as we drove home from that game that afternoon, I, I said to my dad, I'm going to Penn state. And, uh, you know, basically <laughs> fast forward another <laughs> seven, eight years after that. And, uh, you know, going through the college application process and, um, you know, and, uh, I guess the next kind of thing that propelled me towards Penn state was, uh, the film program. So when I was a, a senior in high school, um, our our high school had a media production program, uh, and we basically had a little TV studio, and we shot a bunch of you know it was morning announcements and things like that. But then also you know a bunch of projects that we took on, and um, just in doing research about you know programs around the country, um, really liked what Penn State had to offer. So it, it fit perfectly along with my my love of football. And, um, you know, I was fortunate to be accepted to, to main campus, um, as a freshman. So it, from there, it basically, you know, two of the things that I was really passionate about were perfectly tied together and that's what brought me. So you came to Penn state with some production experience. Talk about some of the things that you were involved in as a student here at Penn state. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I kind of got my feet wet, um, early on, uh, had the opportunity to get involved with, um, at the time it was, it was called uh, Penn State TV, uh, the student television uh, network. Um, and there was a sports program called In the Game uh, and, you know, signed up to be part of that. And uh, I remember going to my first meeting and, you know, the, the question came up about, you know, basically assigning different people sports to shoot. Um, and, you know, of course, some of the, the more popular sports had a long line of people who were really interested and, you know, I kind of was like, hey, I'll, I'll, I I want to do whatever, and um, so I ended up shooting uh, women's volleyball, which at the you know, program is fantastic, and you know, it was awesome to to see a, a team that was so dominant and and you know, um, won a ton of games, and then women's basketball. Um, and at the time when I was in school, Kelly Mazzani was kind of in her prime, and again, an awesome team. You know, it made a couple tournament runs during that period of time. So those are the two sports that I I kind of cut my teeth shooting. Um, and, you know, of course, then doing some editing and things um, that was a big part of my my student experience in addition to my course load. And one of the awesome things about the film program, uh, you know, it's really hands on and technical. So I had the opportunity to, to shoot a lot of um, a lot of different things, you know, documentary classes. Um, that was actually my favorite. You know, I think as I was a student kind of understanding what I loved about production, it was more of the, you know, the nonfiction, right? Like the storytelling that came with documentary and and um, that type of that type of long form storytelling. So that was a lot of what I spent my time on. All right. So this is uh, unscripted. I'm going off script here. I have to ask you after covering women's volleyball, do you have a Russ Rose story? You know, it's funny. I, I don't have a specific Russ Rose story other than just like, I think, you know, watching from the sidelines, I mean, he's just such a great coach, right? Like just the way that he was able to, he, he pushed at the right times. He was able to kind of win when the team with what you could tell things were dragging a little bit and they needed an extra boost. He, he was aggressive and, you know, was able to kind of get everybody motivated, but then, you know, sitting back and you could just tell how much the players genuinely loved playing for him. Um, and it was just so much fun again, like, you know, you have a team that that's, that's that dominant, um, you know, rec hall was packed for every game. It was, the environment was awesome. You know, it's such a great venue. And, uh, yeah, I, of course, you know, I, I went to a ton of, uh, of basketball games as a student and, and football games as well. And those were fun, too. And, you know, loved my experience there. But just strictly speaking, from the perspective of being on the sideline and filming, I, I just really enjoyed those sports a great deal. How, how important I'm way off script now, but how important is the venue? Right. I think of the iconic venues that we have here at Penn State. Certainly the first one everyone thinks about is Beaver Stadium. Right. Um, but there is there is no better venue for women's volleyball for college wrestling than rec hall uh how important is that the venue for a backdrop of of the story that you're telling it's huge you know it's very significant i think when you the energy um in a venue around a live event um and i'm sure we'll talk more as we kind of get further in my career but one of the things that really gets me juiced about what i do is is that, you know, that connection with fans and the environment. And it, it's the fact that it is unscripted, right? Like that you don't know what's going to happen next and the turning points that happen during a game and, um, you know, just seeing the crowd react. And sometimes that can go the other way too, right? When things are ugly and, and the crowd's giving you feedback that they're not happy, right? Like, it, but it all, that 
that loop of energy that kind of feeds from from crowd to team and and then when you're when you're storytelling around it and you know documenting it that it's it's really significant i think there's nothing worse than apathy you know and and when you're in a situation where people aren't really into it or they don't care that that cuts through right like that's right it's you can't hide that so i think it's it's very significant this is the penn state alumni association's coffee hour i'm paul clifford i'm joined today by eric long eric's the vice president for content and production for the philadelphia eagles so eric you graduate from penn state with the degree in film and video Walk us through your career in the sports world after you leave Penn State. So, um, you know, walked in my graduation on a Saturday afternoon, uh, had my car packed, left State College, you know, went back home to my parents at the time they were living in Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania, and didn't really have anything lined up, you know, in the, in the field. Um, the, the year prior, I had interned at a television station uh, in the sports department, had a, a awesome experience. Uh, sports director at WGAL, Pat Principe, awesome mentor, guy that I learned a ton from. Um, but I also, you know, as part of that experience, as, as great as it was, I learned I did not want to work in in local sports TV um, if I had the choice. You know, I didn't, that wasn't really it for me. It didn't, you know, I think it was just so um, short form and, and news and kind of just, you know, you turn through things. And I, I just really always enjoyed longer form storytelling. Um, so, you know, head home, head home for the summer and I've got my, uh, summer job, job lined up, uh, refinishing furniture, <laughs> which was a, a great summer job. Uh, and it just so happened that that summer, um, you know, there was a, a minor league baseball team, independent baseball, uh, that was starting up in Lancaster at the time, uh, the Lancaster Barnstormers. So their inaugural season was that year. And I had reached out, you know, tried to apply for a job there. Hadn't really heard a whole lot back. And literally the Monday after I walked in graduation, I uh, got a phone call. Hey, love to, to talk to you about, you know, maybe working here this summer. Uh, so had a job interview and literally it, like in the course of the 15 minutes or whatever in my interview, they were like, all right, well, what do you got going on today? Can you hang around? Can you, can you work today? And I was like, sure, let's do it. You know, so <laughs> that literally turned into like, <laughs> I, uh, I called up my my boss at my furniture refinishing job and I was like, sorry, I, I got to back out. You know, I got this this gig that's kind of, that's what I want to do. Um, so that summer I worked uh, in minor league baseball, um, you know, basically producing the live show for the, in the stadium and, uh, you know, taking on a little bit of, of um, you know, digital work at the time, honestly, like social media, digital media wasn't really that prevalent. I think Facebook right. had just launched, you know, it was, it was all pretty new. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was focused on, on live game uh, entertainment and literally from that point forward throughout my career, every job has led to the next. So, you know, did that summer in Lancaster and one of the last games of the season had someone approach me and say, Hey, I work. For all right. We're having just a little bit of technical difficulty. Eric, I believe it's on, I believe it's on his end, uh, but we will wait for him to jump back in here in a second. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. We're here talking with Eric Long of the Philadelphia Eagles. He's walking us through his career in the sports world. And uh, we're going to be talking, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, his work at the Philadelphia Eagles, uh, what it was like to be there during the, during the Super Bowl run and uh, just dive into all the great work that he has done in terms of long form storytelling and uh, trying to keep audiences engaged. Uh, Eric's back, Eric, uh, sorry about that. Hope everything is uh, back in order on your end. Sorry about that, can you, am I? Stead, uh, stable now you're, you're great you're great so we you left us at the last game of the barnstormers eric are you back yeah so uh had somebody approach me uh from the crowd and do, do you still have me you're good it's all good okay excellent um had somebody approach me uh after the, the end of the game and uh you know basically say love what you're doing here and would really love to see uh you know if you if you want to 
come up and work in hockey and uh, Reading was just up the road. So I figured to give that a shot and uh, ended up spending about two years there and, and running again, you know, in, in arena production and, um, you know, doing some, uh, just starting to get into some television work as well for them. Uh, from there, ended up, you know, two years later going to Binghamton, New York uh, to work for the Mets AA affiliate for two years, which that was a little, uh, you know, for me personally, it was a little difficult because I always grew up uh, not not really liking the Mets, big Phillies fan, and, you know, they're a major rival. So in this industry, we do, you know, sometimes the, the colors that you're wearing aren't necessarily the ones that you would uh, choose to wear <laughs> on the weekends. Um, but had a fantastic experience there. And really that, that job really kind of, I guess, was my jumping off point to eventually uh, ending up with the Eagles because a lot of what we did in Binghamton was bigger picture. Uh, there was, there was television involved. Um, we were starting to get into the, the soap production goes. Um, and I had an awesome boss who just kind of turned me loose was like, what do you got? You know, and it was, it was one of those places where just creativity and ideas were encouraged. And, um, you know, was really able to just kind of try a lot of different things. Um, so from there, you know, decided to take a consulting uh, gig for about a year. Uh, a friend that I had had through some of these different stops along the way had a, a company that essentially set up uh, minor league teams and universities um, that uh, wanted to put a control room in and hire staff and and uh, basically, you know, create a production team. Um, so I did that for about a year and traveled a ton and met a lot of really great people. Um, and in the process of doing that, I started freelancing uh, here in the Philadelphia market, um, started freelancing for the Philadelphia Phillies and, uh, you know, a friend that uh, has since become a great friend and another mentor along the way. Um, it just so happened by chance. There was a game I was I was DJing the game uh, and he was running the audio board. So I was sitting next to him and just struck up a conversation during the game and talked about like the things I had done in my career and where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And um you know, three months later, there was an opening at the Eagles and he actually reached out to me and said, Hey, I think you should apply for this. Um, you know, it seems to fit what you want to do. And I think you'd be a great fit. And, uh, so I did, and, you know, literally, uh, interviewed with the Eagles, um, on the day before my wedding. Um, so left my job interview and went to the wedding rehearsal, um, <laughs> Uh, left town after the wedding for my honeymoon, got back a couple weeks later and, uh, you know, received an offer. And from that point, um, you know, here I am. <laughs> and there you were, right? And, and then for the next 11 years, you worked with the Eagles, moving up to the organization. Um, I, it, it sounds like it was kind of a circuitous path, right? That there wasn't maybe really a target. Um, but was, was, or, or was it, was the NFL a goal? Were you always an Eagles fan? Like, is this the, is this the dream job for somebody doing what you do? Yeah. Uh, well, I grew up an Eagles fan. Um, you know, the, the, the Eagles of my youth were, you know, the, the late eighties, buddy Ryan, early nineties, um, you know, gangrene defense, Reggie White, Eric Allen, Seth Joyner, Clyde Simmons, you know, Randall Cunningham, right. That was my squad. So I loved the Eagles. Um, they, you know, no, no doubt about that. Um, once I kind of got into the field, I knew, you know, working, especially working in minor league sports, um, you know, just a quick tangent on that minor league sports, such a tremendous experience in, in a career path in, in sports, because you, you do everything. Um, it's small staff, everybody pitches in, you can't, there, there's no such thing as, as somebody who doesn't contribute in minor league sports because you just don't last. You can't right? like it, it's you're efficient, you're lean. Um, and you, it, it also affords you a lot of opportunities, right? Because you can jump in and you can, you can get your hands dirty. It's not, it's not the type of job where you're, you know, getting coffee for somebody every day or right. something like that, right? Like you're, you're in it. Um, so as I worked my way through some of the minor league stops, I knew, you know, kind of doing those things, I, I wanted to do it um, at a, a higher level. You know, I wanted to, to, to get to the major league level and, and work for, you know, to a bigger club. So growing up around, you know, the, the greater Philly area, you know, being a Philadelphia sports fan, definitely, you know, if you asked me my dream job, I would have said, you know, working for one of one of the four teams in Philadelphia. And uh, probably, you know, the Eagles might have been my my favorite stop. 
Uh, but probably the one that I would have told you was the least likely for me to end up because just NFL jobs are so hard and yeah. to, to come by, right? There's not a lot of openings. It's a highly desirable place. Um, so, you know, and a lot of my experience being in baseball and hockey, I, you know, Phillies and Flyers were kind of the two that I figured, oh, well, maybe that's my best shot. But, you know, when that opened up and, and that was the opportunity that came my way, man, you know, it's in terms of a dream job, I am, I am working my dream job. No doubt about that. What does the day-to-day look like for the vice president of production and content? Yeah, so um, a lot of what we do at this point has, has really evolved and shifted towards uh, digital and social media. Um, we still, I guess, just to kind of run through the things our department does. Uh, so, you know, we, we produce all the content for the, the website and app and we still have television shows, although over the years, those kind of have, have reduced a little bit compared to what they were when I started. Um, we were pretty robust in our podcast offerings, so we spent a lot of time on, on podcast production, um, photography, editorial content, you know, really any of the outward facing media of the team. Um, and, and then, of course, during the football season, um, the game presentation and the things that are happening in the stadium on the video boards and, you know, that uh, hopefully are, are adding to the fan experience. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the real quick version of it. I think, you know, and it's the football season has really become very year round. Maybe it always was, but you know, I think throughout my career, I've, I've experienced, I guess, the, the interest level and the coverage really expanding throughout the year. So, you know, right now, a good example is the new league year begins in, in two weeks. So, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing right now is preparing for free agency and trades and, and the things that'll go on, you know, throughout March, a lot of the, the run up to the draft this year is a little unique in that there's not, you know, an in-person scouting combine. Usually that that's something that we would be packing up and, and going to, to cover um, right into the draft in April. And then you've got, you know, mini camp and, and OTAs and all the stuff that happens during the summer, uh, the organized team workouts um, and then training camp in August and, and you're into the football season and the whole cycle starts all over again. So it's, it's definitely a, a big machine. Um, coverage and interest around the team is, is nonstop, really, which is fantastic. And uh, it keeps us busy. Absolutely. How has, you just mentioned, um, not having uh, kind of in-person activities that are part of kind of traditional activities for starting up the NFL season. How has the pandemic changed how business is now conducted um, any pandemic related changes that you all have made in your operations that will carry forward with you after the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the pandemic has significantly impacted what we do. Um, there's definitely some, some great positive things that will come out of it. As far as workflows go, we've become much more uh, nimble in our ability to uh, conduct interviews and create content, you know, whether through virtual um, software, uh, you know, remote situations. Um, we basically, you know, during the season last year, we were able to outfit uh, some rooms in the uh, training facility that basically allowed us to do press conferences and interviews with uh, a player or a coach sitting in a room with nobody in the room with them, you know, a robotic camera and a setup where they could hear and communicate with talent or um, uh, reporters and the media for like a press conference they were able to do all that uh, without having anybody in the room there with them so you know something like that was definitely a, a cool innovation and it took a lot of hard work from people on the team that you know put their heads together um, there's still you know aspects of it that there's really no way around you know in-person coverage so like game days obviously you know last year we, we still uh, had a lot of people in the stadium from our staff in order to cover everything and capture it and, and do that type of thing. But there was a lot of safety protocols that we, you know, adhered to. And I think, you know, as we went through the process, the number one thing first and foremost was keeping everybody safe. Um, you know, football's great. It's really important, but it's more important to make sure that the staff is safe and that, you know, we're not putting people at unnecessary risk. So we spent a lot of time and effort on that. Um, and then also, you know, the next part, I guess, was really how do you, how do we, create as little disruption as possible to the content that we were creating. So how do we, how do we make sure that we're executing all the things we need to execute? And especially when there's sponsorship tied to it and, you know, all the dollars that go into it, um, so, you know, you can't, there's not really an opportunity to say like, well, we're just not going to do that anymore. It's more like, okay, well right. now this is how we're going to do that. Right. 
so that that was a lot of what what we spent time on and i think we pulled it off i mean really in the, the grand scheme of things when you look back it it didn't feel that significantly different or as much as it could have all things considered i, I think one of the keys to being successful in in a role like yours is trying to stay on the cutting edge uh, we have some questions coming in from uh, from our audience, they pre-submitted some of these things, but how do you see the role of OTT streaming and second screen devices changing storytelling around football? I know when I sit down to watch a, a, a football game, Eagles or Penn State, that I have the big screen up on the wall. I have my laptop on my lap. My cell phone's not too far away. Um, and, and there's um, a lot of it is game-related content, right? I'm, I'm following the stats. I'm following Twitter. Uh, talk a little bit about um, how you take a look at the the second and third screens that people might be consuming the game on um, and, and how you build strategies around that. Yeah, I mean, well, the first with the OTT streaming, I mean, it opens up so many opportunities. I think, you know, just putting my, my content creator hat on and, and you know, that, that part of my career, uh, it's this is the best it's ever been, uh, you know. Growing up, you know, even with, I mean, cable television obviously was uh, predominant, you know, for, for a kid growing up in the 90s. But like when you think about where you could go for content, it was, you know, the, the channels were fairly limited. It was it was television. Right. And, it, and within television, it was the channels that existed. And, and within sports, you know, you, you, we didn't have nearly as many channels at that point. I think at that point, maybe ESPN only had two channels. Right. Like right, right. that has ballooned to the point now where like between all the different streaming services, being able to, to stream your own content directly through platforms like YouTube or Facebook or your own website or an app, um, man, it, you know, it, we're able to reach our audience directly. Um, we're able to program however we want. Right. We can have a massive scale uh or the, the reach that we get, right? Like we're not restricted to people right, just in right. the greater Philadelphia DMA. It's, you can reach Eagles fans anywhere and everywhere. Um, and that's a big part of our strategy. So OTT and just being able to, to, to you know, get right into people's living rooms has changed everything. And it's, it's right. awesome from a content creator perspective. And then as far as like the second screen and, you know, other types of content offerings, it's a significant part of our strategy as well. I think, you know, how do you, engage with people in the ways that they want to be engaged with. Um, you know, one of the big parts of our strategy is making sure that we, we don't put all of our eggs in one basket, because I think as soon as you start to assume like, well, this is the way that people should engage with us, right. you lose all the opportunities that, you know, for, for people to interact with you in the way that they want to. So like, when you look at the way that we're doing things, that's why we still have traditional television. Um, that's why we still, uh, you know, as far as like our website, that's still a significant part of what we do, even though not everybody logs on to the internet every day and goes to their favorite websites, right? Like things like push alerts are much more important now or with social platforms, we're, we're on TikTok. That's a big part of our right. strategy because, you know, the people that are on TikTok is usually a young, younger demographic and that's how they interact with our content. So I think it's, you know, trying to be everywhere. Um, but then also when we're trying to be everywhere, trying to be really strategic about what we're putting there. So it's not just taking the same piece of content and putting it on all those platforms and expecting people to interact with it because the audiences are very different. So it's understanding who is in those places and, and what types of things they want to see and what fits that platform. And, um, you know, it's a lot. It's, I think maybe when I started with the team, it was a little less of a juggling act. It was a little more straightforward in, in how we created content. But it's also really exciting because I think the opportunities have just ballooned, right? Like to exponential degrees. It's there's ways to get get in front of anybody ever, anywhere. So that's it's exciting. I think. Yeah, we should have probably started with the definition of OTT. Uh, <laughs> the way the way I understand it, it's kind of um, kind of direct to distribution platform, right? It's it's kind of television and video production but not necessarily for television, right? It's for streaming platforms, but yeah, you could probably give a more technical definition of it. No, I think you nailed it. It's over the top. So essentially, you know, being able to, to, to stream content directly to people that doesn't require them to be on, on cable or, or television. It's, you know, through apps and connected TV and, you know, things like that. Right. You know, you think of the, the skyrocketing prices of NFL football tickets, right? It's, um, it is expensive to kind of get in the building. Um, and, and so when you think of those prices, right, I always think about, okay, what kind of value can we be adding to that experience, right? And, and 
certainly the work that you're doing is is trying to add value to the in-stadium experience, right? Why would I pay X number of dollars to get in my car, drive down there, tailgate, go sit in a stadium, right? Last time I was there, it was it was 30 degrees outside where I could be sitting watching it on watching it on television. Um, what so do you see things, what do you see coming in terms of the in-venue experience, right? gamification um, within the venue, kind of the potential for moving towards micro betting. What are some of the future things that fans who, who do go for that in-stadium experience, what's the added value that they can expect from being there? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think first and foremost is like ensuring that, that you're not missing any opportunities around the game by being at the game, right? There's nothing worse right. than like, well, because you were at the stadium seeing the game in person, you didn't get to have the same experience that you would have had in your living room, right? Like if, if we need to make sure it's, it's it, we're accomplishing that and then some, right? Like to, right. to your point about adding value. So, you know, I think uh, it's, there's a lot that goes into when we program, you know, I guess first speaking to some of the things that we're doing with like the, the digital LED canvases in the stadium, like want to make sure first and foremost, like, you don't have to take your cell phone out of your pocket to know maybe how your fantasy team's doing right? or what the score is in the Cowboys game or whatever. Right. So it's like, how do we present that information in a way that if you want it, it's there, it's available to you on demand. You don't have to fish around and get in your pocket. Do you have, do you have signal? Do you not? Right. Of course, if you, if you want to be able to do that, it's also really important for us to have a great internet connection and uh, you know, video available on your, on your phone and all that type of thing. So it's, again, kind of back to what I was saying earlier about trying to be everywhere, right? Trying to, whatever your your preferred experience is, you know, making right. sure that we're providing that in a, in a great way. Sports betting is definitely really interesting to kind of watch as that's in its infancy, I guess, in coming into venues and having, you know, league deals and, and even team deals. Um, right. Yeah, I'm really interested. That one, I think specifically in football, the NFL has a lot of control over and they've kind of been slow playing how they're working it into things so you know i i wouldn't be surprised if we end up in a situation where you're able to do you know make kind of bets on the game throughout the game in your seat um, i think we're still a little ways away from it because i think they're they're trying to take the right steps and trying to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't create you know issues from the from a competition standpoint or for people having an advantage from being in the stands versus being at home right one of the hardest things is to kind of time those things up um but you know i think it's coming and i think you know premium experiences is a big part of, of the sports world as well. Like, you know, making sure that if you're going to spend your hard earned money to come to a game, how do we make sure that it's really unique that right. no matter what the result on the field that you leave excited about what you experience, feeling like, you know, it was worth the money you paid for it. And that's challenging, especially in a town like Philly, to be completely honest, where fans care right. so much about the product on the field, it impacts everything. But, you know, I think a, a lot of what we look at is like, how do we, how do we accomplish that? So whether it's in, you know, providing unique and individual experiences for people, um, making any barriers or, or friction points um, as minimal as possible so that, you know, you can, you can tailgate if you want, or you can come into the stadium and there's something for you to do. Um, it doesn't take a long time to get through the ticket lines and security lines right. to get in the building, you know, that there's bathrooms available when you want to use the bathroom, that food and beverage is quick and easy, you know, all those things. Um, and it's a lot, you know, fortunately for me, I don't have to worry about all of those things. <laughs> right, right. My, my vision's a lot more narrow, uh, on specifically of the, the content aspect of it. But that's, you know, as an organization, I think we've got a lot of people that work really hard on that. And it's a little tough because to some extent, I think we're always chasing, you know, trying to, to be the best that we can and provide that experience. And sometimes you nail it and sometimes you, you learn from the failures. Um, but, you know, I guess one of the things that I love about, you know, working for the Eagles is that we've got an organization that cares a great deal about it. So it's that stuff doesn't go undiscussed or, you know, we're, we're always trying to be better and improve. And I think not every place is like that. So I think, you know, it's a, a credit actually to our ownership and our, our executive team, you know, that manage yeah. the, the organization. So two part question coming uh, that, that I have for you. So I think about your career, right? And when you when you start with the barnstormers, right? It's it's dizzy bat races and t-shirt cannons, right? Uh, yep. To the to the really high level of sophistication of of what you're doing today with the Eagles. So two part, and I think Chris Britta is talking, asking a question similar to this, and uh, Kevin Cutner. 
uh, asking something that so two parts one how has um, the industry changed um, and how has kind of the in stadium experience changed over your career and then if you could um, uh, I'll steal Kevin's question put the virtual reality glasses on for a second and look into the future what are some of the future things he's referencing VR used by the NBA um, some of those types of experiences. And so how has it changed and maybe what are some of the things that are coming right down the pipeline? Yeah, great question. I mean, it's changed significantly. Um, when I started with the team in 2009, uh, we were producing uh, five weekly television shows. Um, and most of our resources honestly went into to those television shows because that was our primary distribution outlet. We did put content on the website, but, you know, streaming speeds, things like that just weren't weren't what they are now. So, you know, I don't think people engage nearly as much, especially as long form content on the internet at that point. Um, you know, fast forward to today. And I think while we still, you know, are probably the most significant thing that we put time and resources into on TV now is the preseason broadcast. So we, the, the club is fully responsible for producing uh, the broadcast of our preseason games. And then of course, during the NFL season, uh, uh -huh. the major networks do all the production around around the television broadcast, but it's a, a significant source of revenue um, for NFL teams, right? Because we control all the ad inventory, we control the way that we execute the show. So we spend a lot of time and effort on that still. Aside from that, the shorter programming, which, you know, the things that, you know, are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. before the game, things like that, we're not doing nearly as much of that. But a lot of that time gets spent on the programming that we're putting across all of our social and digital channels. So you know, it, you have, you have long form content and, you know, we program our, our site and YouTube for things like that. You have short form content, you know, and stuff that's a little more quick hitter or maybe a design for um, an audience with a shorter attention span that that's, you know, going on Instagram or, or Facebook um, or Twitter, you know, so right. it, the spectrum of kind of what we're able to offer has changed. And, and I think that's, that's pretty significant looking ahead. It's, it's really interesting, especially, you know, brought up the VR uh, from the question. So virtual reality is absolutely something that we look at it, you know, and continue to keep an eye on as well as augmented reality, AR, um, which essentially the biggest difference is virtual reality is you have a fully virtual environment, right? That everything's um, programmed where augmented reality is interacting with actual reality, right? So that's like things right. like heads up displays and putting content in places where you're actually, you're, you're still looking at the field, but maybe, you know, something pops up, a graphic pops up out of the field or, or some, something else that you can interact with, you know, happens in the, in the actual reality. I think, you know, the key with all that stuff is experiential experiences, or well, I guess that's a little redundant, but experiential right, right. <laughs> um, content, right? So being able to like making it more about where the user uh, helps to, to dictate some of that journey. You're choosing right. what you're seeing, you're choosing what you're interacting with versus you know, a more traditional platform where, you know, especially TV being the most traditional platform, other than changing the channel, there's not a lot of opportunity to interact with what you're watching. It's there. If you want it, great. If you don't, you turn it off, right? Now that we're kind of moving towards like some of these other types of experiences, I think it, you, it's a lot more, um, we're a lot more nimble and you have to be a lot more well thought out with how you, what you program for those spaces. So, you know, doing things like where people, you know, one of the one of the experiences that we've been working on and i think you know hopefully as we start to bring fans back in the building is something really cool when you walk into lincoln financial field in our head house lobby we have a, a nice display with all of our retired numbers and the eagles hall of fame so what we talked about is like creating uh, an experience in our mobile app where basically you when you hold your camera up over you know this this mural um, it's able to, you know, you've got anchors on the numbers as they're up there, the retired numbers, and maybe it plays you. So now you see Reggie White's number. Well, let's play you a Reggie White highlight because, and especially for a younger audience that maybe didn't have the opportunity to see, to see Reggie White play. Um, here's his highlights. This is why people, why he is in the Eagles Hall of Fame, why he's so well revered, right? right. That's the type of stuff. I think that as we look about at our, our building and the experience and when you bring people in and how you how you engage with people, you know, as we're looking to the future. I think that's a lot of what we're spending time on back to the sports betting thing. I can see that layering in with that as well. Right. Like cause right. if you're in the venue and you're paying attention to what's happening and seeing like stats and little bits of information that might help you make decisions on that type of stuff. I think that's all not in the too, too distant future. Absolutely. You know, uh, Eric shifting gears a little bit here, we talk about the power of the Penn state network, right? And, and we know that there's Penn Staters employed by, um, employed by the Eagles, right? We see Miles Sanders on the field. Steph Wisniewski was there for a while. 
But on the other side of the house, um, you're working with a lot of Penn Staters. I know you take interns. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the, the Happy Valley to Philadelphia pipeline that is, that is in place for, um, for Penn Staters who, who want to work or want to go on to internships uh, with you. Yeah, I mean, that pipeline is real. Uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of Penn Staters uh, amongst our front office and, and in leadership positions and, uh, you know, proud Penn Staters. I think people, you know, we, it's funny, it's, it's like our own little mini network in the building, but, right. um, you know, it, one of the cool things I think is, is that pipeline, you know, as we bring young people in and, and engage with people from, as interns and, and entry level positions, um, you know, Bob Martin in the College of Communications is somebody I've stayed in touch with over the years. Once upon a time, he helped me land an internship right back, you know, almost 20 years ago now. Um, so he's somebody that I, you know, talk to every year, you know, a couple, a couple students he sends my way, we stay in touch. Um, LinkedIn is certainly a great tool in connecting right. with, you know, people, young people trying to get into the field or um, making moves from other teams, maybe ready to like from going from an entry level uh, position, ready to take the next step in their career. So that's very real. It's something that, you know, I think one of the, the things that, you know, when I think about what I've loved about my journey and, and what I do is the connections with people um, and that, that network's powerful. And there's been a lot of great people in my career that have mentored me or taken the time to help me out or answered an email when I was trying to get a foot in the door. So for me, a big part of what's really important to, to make sure I, I continue to cut out time you know, in my day is, is for that same thing to pay it forward and have those same connections and conversations. And look, I'm not always going to have a job that I'm able to give somebody or a position, but if nothing else, maybe I can help share some advice or connect them with somebody else or, you know, help them look at their resume or their reel or something like that. And that, I think that stuff is, is just so critical. Um, you know, to me, it's a big part of, I think what makes Penn State great is, is that network. And it's something that, um, that I take very seriously, you know, in, in the time that I spend with people. You're watching the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined today by Eric Long. He's the Vice President of Content and Production for the Philadelphia Eagles. Eric, we have seen examples, some funny, some not so funny, examples of misses in the content space, right? Uh, both online and in venue. Um, I think about uh, some of the serious tones that um, that you all had to hit this summer, right? When it comes to Black Lives Matter after the the killing of George Floyd, and how involved the NFL got uh, got um, with that with those issues, and how involved your players got with those issues, can you talk? Kind of give us a little bit of insight on what some of those production meetings were like, and how you kind of thought about telling those stories um, as all that was happening. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. I think an important part of the responsibility that we have as a content team is, you know, really constantly evaluating the landscape out there, right? Sometimes it's as it relates specifically to what's happening with the organization. And sometimes it's what's happening with the world, right? And um, last summer is a great example. There were several days, especially throughout, um, throughout May, where we just didn't post. It just didn't feel appropriate. Like, you know, with everything going on, it was kind of like, Right now, nothing that we have to say from a football standpoint is really that important. Um, you know, there, there was much bigger things taking place. And I think, you know, it, it's one of those things that in sports, it's interesting because you've got a lot of personalities, a lot of viewpoints on the roster, right? Like you're bringing together, essentially, you know, in the case of a football roster, you know, 80 strangers, right? Like as we're kind of coming together and and they're, they're all going to have different experiences, different viewpoints. So you know, it's like, how do we, how do we make sure we're supportive of the things that, that our players are doing and the, the good that they're trying to, uh, to do and um, the difference they're trying to make? Um, you know, how do we, how do we do it in a way that we're not necessarily um, alienating other players that might have different viewpoints? You know, of course, as long as they're, they're respectful viewpoints and they're not, you know, um, you know, uh, bigoted or, or small-minded or right, right, like, right. That we don't want to support those things, of course, but you know, it's just, it's different for everybody. So I think it, it, fortunately we're our ownership, um, and our executive leadership team are very in tune with those things. They take it very, very seriously. And we spent a lot of time just paying attention to that stuff. And I think they're very supportive also of like, you know, when situations come up, um, you know, our organization is very socially minded. 
um, and the things that we do. Uh, we're very active in the community. Um, there's a lot of initiatives that we've got, you know, whether it's uh, our social justice fund, whether it's our Go Green program with recycling and, um, you know, being environmentally friendly, whether it's, you know, the work that we do in the autism community with Eagles Autism Foundation. I think, you know, those things are all priorities for us. Uh, of course, you know, football is important. We're a football team, but yeah. it's it, the opportunity that we have to make such a, a bigger and greater impact than just football. Um, that's something that I think we understand and um, that we spend a lot of time and effort and energy on. So it's another thing that makes me really proud to be, you know, part of this organization. It's, um, I feel like, you know, to your point, like you don't always get it right, right? But I, right. I think our, our intentions are always in the right places. We're always trying. And I think right. when things aren't right, you know, it's like, okay, what do we do to get there, right? Like you're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn along the way. How do you go about in a way where you're not just reacting to everything all the time, but you're you're taking the time to really understand things, have the right response, you know, be supportive. And it's, you know, it's it's a constant, there's no blueprint or playbook of like, just do right. this, this, and this, and you're going to get it exactly right. 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 Like it's ever evolving. And I think um, you have to go into it with that mindset of like the approach that like, we're just going to, we're going to learn as we go and we're going to do the best we can. And we're, when we don't get it right, we're going to make sure we, we do the steps to correct it. Right. Absolutely. You know, I think, um, and bear with me for this analogy, but I think that there's some parallels between the work that we do. Kevin's asking a question here about professional sports as, um, as being competitive and competition with other teams. I, there's certainly competition on the field, right? But the work that you and I do, I think the parallels are is that we're working with a constituency that has a specific affinity to our organization, right? Tomorrow, I'm not going to be a, uh, a New York Giants fan, right? I'm going to be a Philadelphia Eagles fan. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about I know when I see colleagues around the country doing some really neat and innovative things, I can pick up the phone and call them and they, they tell me how they're going about doing that. Is it that kind of culture on your side of the shop uh, in professional sports where you can um, kind of tap into a network of what people are doing with other sports franchises and they kind of freely share best practice? Absolutely. Um you know, back to one of my favorite things about my job, I mentioned, you know, people, and, and that's, that's the other part of it. It's like, you know, working with your staff and working with, with people who are coming into the industry. I love the connections that, uh, that over the years I've made with counterparts at other teams, other organizations. Um, you know, it's such a, working in sports is definitely, it's a niche career, right? Like there's, there's a kind of a finite number of, of positions and, and organizations and leagues, right? Like it's, it, so I think, you know, there's a unique, um, unique bond that you share with the other people who do what you do for other teams. And I think, you know, being able to share those best practices, help each other out, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because my, so I have a son, he's eight years old and right. uh, he, he's at that age where he just, he loves sports and he's so into them. And it's so funny because, you know, I'll be doing something with him and call will come up on my phone and it'll be like, you know, somebody and it'll say like Minnesota Vikings. And he'll say, dad, why are the Vikings calling you? You know? And I'm like, oh, that's my right. friend, Alan, right? Like I'm going right. to, I'm going to catch up with him. Right. So he, we're, we're talking about like, Hey, this new policy came down. How are you dealing with that? Or what did, what did you guys do to get around this? Whatever. Right. Like we're, right, we're figuring right. out stuff together. And it's, it's so interesting too, how you end up with some of the best friendships in sports. You know, I, one of my really good friends works for the Cowboys. Right growing up an Eagles fan, like I, there's no love here for the Cowboys, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, like when, like when, when Corey from the Cowboys calls me, I'm answering that phone and I'm excited right. to talk to him. So there's unique bonds and, and uh, relationships that I think um, it's part of what makes the industry great. And I think, you know, you, you said it perfectly on, on the field, we're absolutely competitors. I hope we beat them every single time we play them. Right. But, you know, it's one of the cool things too, is like watching a Super Bowl, like what we just, you know, watching the Bucks and the, the Chiefs. Right. You know, I, I'm, am I disappointed that we're not playing in that Super Bowl? A hundred percent. You know, I always want to be in the Super Bowl, but I can also appreciate when I'm watching the game. I'm like, you know, my, my again, my son saying to me, dad, who do you want to win? I hope the Chiefs win. I'm like, I don't care. Like whoever wins, I've, I'm happy for the people. And if the Bucks win, I've got friends that are with right. the Bucks. If the Chiefs win, I'm happy for them again. Right. Like you start to root for the people that, you know, in those places and, and 
you know, in the case of the Super Bowl, it was fun from for the Bucks to win because my friends that worked at the Bucks had never won a Super Bowl before. My friends at the right. Chiefs got one last year, so I didn't feel bad for them, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, that's how it works, and it's it's just a cool it's a cool small uh, industry and, and network. Can you? Um, so I I'm a lifelong Philadelphia Eagles fan. Um, I had gotten to the point in my life where I had kind of um, given up that we would be a Super Bowl champion. Uh, and then, right, played in two Super Bowls, the four consecutive NFC championship games, uh, but then not not for it to happen. I thought that was kind of the run, going to be the run in my lifetime, and then the improbable run a couple of years ago. Uh, talk a little bit about what it was like to be um, around that playoff run and what that, like, uh, like containing the excitement, right, around it, but also – some of the uh, maybe more unique opportunities that you and your team had to tell some stories around that run. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was starting to think I was the jinx Paul because I, right. I joined the organization in 2009 uh, right. and uh, <laughs> 2008 was our fifth uh, NFC championship game uh, in right. the, in the two thousands. And then we, uh, we hadn't won a playoff game for a few years uh, <laughs> after I'd started with the team up until 2017. So I think I, what, that, I went nine years with, or eight years without a playoff win um, wow. until we finally won one. So I was starting to think maybe uh, it, was, it was my fault and I needed to, to step aside so that, you know, for the good of the team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 2017 was an amazing year. Um, you know, just such a fun team. Uh, you know, when, when your team is winning, working in sports is fun all the time. Right. It's way more fun when your team is winning. Right. So that season, you know, the, the things we were able to do, the stories we were able to tell, uh, first of all, you know, when, when the players are feeling really good about how they're doing on the field, that definitely impacts things. They open up more, they're excited to, to be part right. of things, right? They're having fun, that's visible. Um, but then, you know, going down the stretch, you know, especially once we were in the playoffs and it was such a unique year with having our starting quarterback get hurt at the end of the year and then, you know, have Nick Foles come in and it's just, it just such a unique you know, real like storybook kind of situation. Um, you know, I was, I remember the night before the Super Bowl, I was just so nerves, right? I was so anxious. I couldn't sleep. It had been a long week. We'd done so much. I just kept thinking like, what did we miss? What did we, play? and then we got to game day and it was just like, here it is. It doesn't matter. Right. Like the game is being played. Like we're going to cover it. It's going to be fun. You know, I was in a fortunate position to, to be on the sidelines for the entire game. So I, oh, I wow. shot most of the game on my cell phone um, for our, so we basically, the way we kind of deployed our strategy, we had, I think it was five people on the field and it was a mix between, you know, traditional cameras um, and then cell phones. Cause we were also posting constantly to social media throughout right. the game. And the easiest way to do it was on phone. So I have a unique, uh, basically my entire Super Bowl experience is still on my phone. I have all the clips that I shot That's as awesome. they were happening. Yeah. Um, which, you know, and it, it was definitely a pinch yourself moment because I think like, you know, I, I think even before I worked in sports and, you know, had, had a legitimate, I guess, opportunity to potentially be at a Super Bowl. I always, that's one thing as a kid, I was always like, man, it would be so cool to be on a super, at a Super Bowl. It would be so cool to be on the field for a Super Bowl. It would so, be so cool to be celebrating with your team as they're winning on the field after the Super Bowl, right? Right. So just that, that whole day, that whole experience is just, it's, it's some of my fondest memories. Um, you know, it's definitely something that I think even, you know, you have a tough year like what we just had. Right. I, you know, I still think about like, well, there was 2017, right? So, and right. I, I look forward to like having that opportunity again, right? And I think, I think we will. Um, so it's, it's definitely, I think, one of the parts of the job that there's just nothing else really like it. I think it's, it's, it's by far the coolest. Um, no doubt about it. I can't, there's no way to really dress it up or sound more right, professional. Right. Than that. <laughs> right. Well, Eric, I, I feel like we could go for another hour. Uh, but um, we have a tradition here on coffee hour where we ask some fun questions here at the end. So I'm going to get to our lightning round here um, and ask you just some quick hitter Penn state questions. So, First, what is your favorite Penn State memory? Ooh, favorite Penn State memory. Um, 2005 Ohio State game. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it, I, <laughs> enough said, right? Uh, so at that point, I graduated. I graduated in May 2005, but, uh, right. you know, went back up to the game. And, uh, man, it, what, what an environment, um, what an experience, you know, sat in the student section because I still had friends that were students at the time. Right. right. Um, there's nothing else quite like that. I guess the second best, the second closest thing to that, which doesn't nearly 
nearly touch it, but um, uh, as a student in 2002, three, uh, when Larry Johnson broke 2,000 yards. Um, oh yeah, Michigan State in State. the snow. Yep, yep. Yeah. So just that was just such an awesome, you know, favorite experiences, I, I guess, as it relates to football. There's a lot of fun experiences along the way with like friends and classes and things like that, but those two probably stand out as, as significant. Absolutely. How about um, your favorite class at Penn State? Favorite class at Penn State? Uh, well, I would probably go with my, um, I don't remember the exact number, uh, Com. maybe it was Com 437. I could be making that up, but right. 400 level Com class uh, tech topics with uh, Richie Sherman. Um, we spent the semester uh, basically recreating scenes from, from famous movies. And the whole idea was to create the same lighting setups and and oh, wow. frame the shots exactly the same way. And I think that that was one for me where it was like, wow, like everything really clicked of like, like not only like, oh, these these legendary movies and scenes, you know, they're awesome, but like I can make stuff that looks like that. I can make stuff right. that that, you know, is up to that level. So that was that was just such an awesome class. Um your most unusual we are moment, right? You you mentioned it um when we were off off camera that you go to all the away games, right? And so mm -hmm. that means that you're, you're traveling fairly often. What's the most unusual we are moment that you've had where you heard we are and it kind of was out of context or caught you off guard? Uh, yeah, it, so it, probably the, the most unique moment. I was uh, on vacation um, in the Canary Islands, Spain uh, in 2018. And I was wearing Penn State hat, you know, and hiking in some remote desert location and walked right. by, by a hiker and got a we are and I was, it was like the only person we had seen for I think an hour or something like that um that was pretty I was just like whoa like you know it was that's it was awesome. pretty crazy yeah yeah that's awesome um I think you tipped your hand on this one but your favorite Penn State sport I mean, it's hard not to say football just because of what I do, but you know, I, I'll go back to I, Penn State volleyball. Like that was just so many fond memories, and I think, um, you know, really enjoyed enjoyed the, that experience. So, you know, I'll put that right up there. All right, and how about your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? <laughs> Well, so it's funny when I was a student, vanilla milkshakes were my go-to, which is really boring. So that's probably not a good answer, but uh, I'd probably have to go peanut butter cup because I think, you know, I'm a big, a big peanut butter and ice cream fan. And uh, right. that's that you can't really beat. It's, it's not complicated. It's not, it's not crazy, but man, is it good. That's awesome. Eric, Hey, thanks for spending so much time with us this morning on coffee hour and allowing us to share your story with fellow Penn Staters. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And to our audience here in the Zoom room and to those of you on Facebook Live, thank you for joining us. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not, what are you waiting for? Go to our website today at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State.